Welcome back, guys. How you doing, Ryan? Greg? Good, Woody. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, I thought we would just jump on five days after our initial conversation at the start of the week because the week started with a bit of a bang. It feels like that bang is now back to normal. Um, Ryan, I know you've been... I wanted to get your thoughts, though, because, I don't know, these things... Uh, it's a very big thing, the unwinding of the carry, carry trade, and we, we touched on that. If you haven't seen the video on Monday, do go ahead and have, have a have a look at that discussion because it, it, it was very interesting. We got a good response actually from readers. People really uh, valued that discussion. But Ryan, you've been doing a bit of a deep dive all week on that. And I know it's an ongoing, mm. um, it's an ongoing investigation. So you'll probably yeah. have more, more things to come next week, perhaps. But you said to your readers this week, I mean, this, bearing in mind, this was to your crypto capital readers. You said in the short run, high volatility will echo over the next few weeks as the markets try to understand what really happened. Uh, was it just the market meltdown triggered by some over leveraged traders in Japan or was it a hint of some deeper problems to come? So I thought that would be a really good place to start. Um, what's your what, what what where are you leaning towards with your reading that you've done and your delving that you've done this week? Yeah, look, I'm, I wrote about it a bit. Uh, on Monday, in, in fact, the old daily, and I'm going to write a little bit more about it this Monday, so hopefully a little bit more detail. But as you said, it's an ongoing investigation. And what I've sort of uncovered so far about this carry trade situation is that it is, it's bigger than I maybe realized before this happened, because it's not just a bunch of hedge funds that no one cares about getting caught on the wrong side of a trade. It's actually a, a structural carry trade, which is basically the whole Japanese economy. It includes the central bank. It includes all the banks and insurance companies. There's so much debt in the Japanese system. I think the debt to GDP ratio is 266%. Um, that they're stuck in a world where they can't really raise interest rates and they can't afford for the yen to get too strong too quickly. Um, it's a complex situation. And I, like I said, I'm still investigating it. But when I think you asked me on Monday, why does like a 0.2% a or 0.25% rise cause so much trouble? It's tiny. It's a blip. It's because there's this massive structural weakness in Japan where there's so much, uh, there's been such a 0% a, a uh, interest rate environment for so long, you're talking like decades, uh, and it's got, and that's resulted in so much debt being put on the central bank's balance sheet where they can't do anything except keep on printing money to, to roll this debt over. They can't, um, they can't pay off any of this debt, and that results generally in the, the yen weakening over time. Now, the other side of that trade, if you think of, of Japan as one big corporation, so we'll call it Japan Inc., they've been using, if, if their currency is weakening, which it has been for, for years, they invest money overseas in bonds and stocks and things like that in the US. And they make money from the returns on that, but they also make money from the, the yen being weaker and weaker as well. And so that's the whole carry trade. And that's the whole economy, basically. <laughs> and so what we got a hint of this week was everyone thinking, well, what happens if that whole situation changes? And I think that's why the panic was so extreme. Like we had volatility that was matching, you know, the 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 the, the times of the 1987 Black Monday crash. We had falls in the market that were bigger than when COVID hit. So these kind of extreme moves are not something you can just ignore and say, hey, markets have bounced back. It's all back to normal. I think what we've maybe seen this week was that the Bank of Japan governor came out a day or two, a day ago, I think it was, and said, hey, by the way, we're not going to raise interest rates if this market, market tur turbulence, which is another way of Fed speak of saying, hey, we'll calm down on this. We'll find a solution to this for now, so please don't sell. And the clue to that was that the yen started weakening again. So the, the yen against the dollar started weakening, which suggests that behind the scenes, the Bank of Japan, probably in some sort of coordinated action with the, the US Fed, is finding a way to maybe calm the situation down for now. And we saw a big bounce back in the Bitcoin price. We saw a bit, bit of a bounce in tech stocks as well, especially overnight, as the market sort of said, or, or the trading side of the market, the hot money side of the market said, hey, the trade's back on for now. Let's jump back in. So that's where we're at now. None of that changes the structural weakness. But look, as, as Greg knows, we've had structural weaknesses in the economy building up for, for, for decades. And the, the, the continual actions of federal uh, of central banks is to kick the can down the road and find ever exotic ways to do it uh, for example the um they managed to bail out the regional banks in the u.s just just recently you know the, the u.s regional banks or it, maybe even the whole u.s banking system was basically insolvent because 
when when the when the Fed raised interest rates really fast, the value of the bonds that the bank held were basically you know cut in half almost. And so if you went to take your money out of a bank at that time, the bank didn't have your money, so the Fed had to come in with a with a with a rescue package, which somehow managed to paper over paper over that crack. And I think that's what they're doing now. But none of these actions change the overall situation. So I'm not I'm not being a, a negative. The, the sky is falling in. I'm just saying that is the structural situation we're in. But for now, markets are saying, hey, they're going to keep papering over this for now. And as long as that's the case, the the carry trade dynamics work, and that means you can make money by, you know, <laughs> using borrowed money or or going long stocks uh, and 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 short volatility. Uh, just just while we're still on on you, Ryan, uh, you mentioned also that um, obviously we've had a complete unwind of leverage in the crypto ecosystem. And yeah. it seems like any crypto hedge funds that were caught up in the carry trade drama have also sold up. Can you just explain how a carry trade in the traditional <laughs> currencies affects the crypto world? And what's um, crypto hedge funds? What are they doing in the carry trade? Yeah, how, the, what's the link? The, you've got to remember the crypto market is so volatile uh, with the you know, immense gains on, on the table that there are risk taking hedge funds that they're, they're, they're not the, these are not the mainstream hedge funds but there are specialist hedge funds that borrow money in Japan or borrow cheap money and invest it in crypto and you and you just it's just a way of magnifying your gains and that that works out fine as long as the volatility stays in a, within a certain parameter they can make money going long and short but when we had the kind of panic we saw on Monday the falls were that steep and that fast and you've got to remember crypto is a 24 7 market there's no circuit breakers there's no uh, no one coming to bail you out. That what looking at the data now, you can see that all of the leverage or most of the leverage in the whole crypto ecosystem basically got wiped out. So anyone who was on the wrong side of that train got liquidated, and that happened all the way down to about forty nine thousand US dollars per Bitcoin. And then when all that leverage was liquidated, um, suddenly there was no more sellers, and the price has now jumped back to about I think it's about sixty one thousand US dollars now. So that's a massive rebound. And that's what you tend to see in crypto markets. There's a, when there's these moments of panic, whether it's um, COVID or whether it's when when a big exchange called FTX failed a few years ago, there's these panic falls. The, the the volatility is extreme on the downside. All the leverage gets wiped out. We reach a point of extreme fear, and then suddenly there's this big rebound. Um, and that seems to be happening again. Another interesting point yesterday was that Morgan Stanley, who are a big um, financial advisor in the US, they've got about fifteen thousand uh, strong advisory network. They just uh, coincidentally approved um, Bitcoin ETFs on their approved product list, which means they can, you know, recommend that to advisors, and that's quite a big move because Morgan Stanley's been a bit of a skeptic on Bitcoin for a while. So behind the scenes, the trend for Bitcoin and crypto isn't changing, but the extremities of the volatility—it's not immune from the extremities of the volatility—and uh, the carry trade affects it because it's the same dynamics but on steroids. It's a very small market cap. The players that do this have to deal with immense volatility, which can magnify the, the gains and losses in play. And one interesting thing I sort of took from the, the week was if we ever do get a panic, uh, someone said that all correlations go to one. Like there's almost no safe haven in a panic when no one knows what's going on. Every asset goes down. I mean, even gold, which held up all right initially, started falling a little bit. And that's because there's just people trying to unwind positions any way they can. They're trying to sell whatever they can get their hands on. They unwind positions, pay off debt stem the losses before they go completely bust and the interesting thing about the crypto market in that context is is it's one of the easiest places to sell when you need to because it never shuts and and a really good thing about this fall or a good demonstration of of the crypto ecosystem in general was all the protocols of DeFi, which are decentralized finance protocols that allow you to buy and sell and borrow and lend none of them went down none of them none of them went bust first of all none of the protocols just you know couldn't handle it there was no downtime um, so you could get access to your money. You could get out of a position when you wanted. No one had special access over you. It wasn't like JP Morgan could do it, but you couldn't. You, you compare that to the existing system. Um, brokerages like Robinhood and Fidelity and Schwab were all down for the first couple of hours of trade yes, on Tuesday when there was a big bounce back. So retail punters that thought they could, wanted to get back into the market to see an opportunity, the first two hours of the day, they couldn't. <laughs> but the institutions could, and a lot of them bought really hard on Tuesday. And by the time the retail people could get in, Ah well, the, the first bump's gone, and that just points to the broader benefits of a of a, an ecosystem which has no bailouts, 
has to find ways to harden itself over time without interventions. And over time, such a system gets stronger and stronger and more powerful. And I think that's a really interesting takeaway that you don't see written about anywhere else, but it was a fact of, of what I noticed on, on Monday. Mm. What about you, Greg? It seems like uh, you said at the start of the week that it doesn't really change your strategy to your to your readers uh, and that yours is to, to, to buy good companies at good prices. So I guess you're, you're, you probably just sat back and watched what was going on. Just pretty stress-free, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, look, I, to be honest, it wasn't a, a big... Um... Yeah. A big concern for any of the, the stocks in the portfolio. Of course, no one likes to see the volatility of the actual price moving around. It's very hard to separate yourself psychologically from what the price of your portfolio does. But I think if you have a good understanding of where actual value lies, it makes dealing with that volatility a lot easier. Um, I, I do think, though, that, you know, like Ryan said, that there, there are some major structural uh, weaknesses in, in the economy and they were. Uh, exposed this week. Um, the difficult thing with looking at structural issues is timing. You know, there's no reason why this structural flaw can't continue for another couple of years, or this may have been the first sort of indication that says, look, you know, this is this is starting to unwind. And if you just to continue on that sort of macro sort yep. of theme, if you continue to see inflationary pressures build in in japan you're going to see the bank of japan have to react at some point they might not do it in the next couple of months or they might wait for the volatility to die down but they're going to be on a tightening bias over time which is going to slowly take away that incentive to continue this carry trade so that's something that's working against uh i guess the speculative side of things and the other thing i would just say is that to me it feels like the ai bubble uh, I wouldn't say is popped, but but there's there's a definite um, fracture in that trade for now. So, uh, and and I think a lot of that gets lost in this talk about the carry trade is that the 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 Mag Seven were the beneficiaries of a lot of that carry trade, beneficiaries of a lot of that hot money, uh, beneficiaries of just the momentum trade. From looking at the way those share prices have reacted and the volatility we've seen, and yes, you know the markets are up strongly overnight, but I think I saw a headline saying you know, best performance of the S&P 500 since 2022. Like when you get that type of volatility, that's not a, that's not a good thing. It's, it's showing that there's a lot of indecision, there's money moving out, there's money rushing back in. And to me, this is like a bit of a, uh, I think in the, in the words of, you know, markets, it's a regime shift. We're shifting from what used to be the Mag 7 trade, the only trade in town to something else. And we're not quite sure what that something else looks like at the moment. Uh, but one of the things I talk about a lot is that, you know, these big companies are now investing huge amounts of money uh, in, in their data center rollout. That's a more capital intensive business than what they've previously uh, had. And once the market realizes that, these companies will trade on lower multiples. So that they're, they're, they're less capital light than what they used to be. And over time, they will trade on a lower multiple. So whether that requires a, a big correction in their share prices and it go, and they the, the share price sort of sell-off gets overdone or whether it slowly sort of moves back to that level or hey even you know we could see another rally back up to a blow-off top type of situation we don't really know how this is going to play out all i'm sort of thinking is we've had the first indication that we're at the start of a, a, of a regime shift and that could be moving into a more volatile period we're moving into the whole september october traditional volatile period in market so um but wouldn't, wouldn't yeah, that I certainly make, don't think it's back to normal. Wouldn't that make private money behave differently? So, for example, so so clearly the Japan Central Bank, they, they made that decision to raise rates because they felt they had to. Now, they're, as Ryan alluded to, they've probably had some, you know, they're having some words behind closed doors and they're, they're staving it off. But that's got to tell you it's coming to an end. I would think so. Um, but look, you know, when I think I've... I've had my head in the macro environment for long enough that I just now know that there's no point making predictions. So the, the, the macro can, can, can go on for years when it just doesn't seem like it should. So we don't really know, but I, I think if you're looking at just indications and trends, you know, the, um, the central bank's been slowly raising rates for a little while now, very, very slowly, uh, but seem to be happy to tolerate inflation at higher levels 
uh, relative to interest rates than, say, other central banks. So there's a big differential where Japanese rates are and US rates are. And I guess the other thing to keep in mind is if the US start to um, start to raise raise rates, that differential gets shorter. So then that is that a real possibility? Well, I think it disincentivizes the carry trade even more, right? So there's less incentive to to borrow cheaply in yen and, and invest in higher yielding U.S. Treasuries. Um, so yeah, look, there's there's a lot of uncertainty around. All I would say is this this marks a little bit of a shift in in what we've seen so far in 2024, and I think the rest of the second half of the year will probably be a, a fairly bit different. First half of the year, zero volatility, boring, same trade worked month after month, day after day. Second half of the year, I think it'll be a bit different. And what will you be uh, uh, advising readers, Greg? Is it, do, do you have like any particular sectors on on your watch list? I know not necessarily well, as a result of this, or is it is will it just be like the the, the picks that you have in your portfolio? Look, buy it at, at these dips. Yeah, look, I think you know my my view has been that energy, relative to many other parts of the market, is is extraordinarily cheap. Um, sometimes those relative cheapnesses continue for a, a long time. Um, so I've been wrong on, on the energy uh, call f- so far this year because energy hasn't really done too much. But if you look at, just for example, go, uh, the oil gold ratio, that's in favor of gold, the most it's ever been. I think it's only ever been more in favor of gold uh, a couple of times in the past 20 or 30 years. So gold is quite expensive relative to oil. Oil's very cheap relative to gold. So to me, that tells me that there's relative value in that trade. But because the economy is, you know, there's concern of the economy, the economy slowing down, everyone thinks, okay, energy's going to take the hit for that. But if you look out beyond the, beyond the next six months, you know, I think there's, there's huge amounts of value there. Um, I've spoken about coal stocks before to my subscribers. There's, you know, they're generating significant cash flows. If you look at coal prices, they weren't even affected by what happened um, this week. The oil price was obviously um, impacted. Coal prices weren't impacted at all. So there's lots of value, I think, in that sector. And that's all I'm doing. You know, each week I, I do scans. I look for different stocks, see what's out of favor, look for the stocks where there's pessimism built into the price. And when there's pessimism built into the price, that means there's generally good value on offer. You just have to wait sometimes for for that value to be realized. Yeah, I think next week, Brian, we might get uh, you and, and Brian on a call to discuss the the, the gold side of things. Because you, you did actually say we had a, a, a chat in midweek and you said, as far as you can tell, as of now, obviously things might change. The natural recipients of this, the events is, or the natural solution is crypto, i.e. Bitcoin, and gold yeah and in fact um, you did make a bit of a prediction in your update you said if this plays out again you could be expecting 300k bitcoin by 2025 <laughs> I yeah I, mean, I think i think what i was pointing out in the update was 300k bitcoin would be a normal price for bitcoin based on past cycles and and the funny thing about this cycle which we can probably take from you know the halving cycles which happen every four years is it's actually played out very similarly to past cycles which is interesting um I think um, the reason I sort of see Bitcoin and gold as the recipients, because I know what Greg was saying about the, the macro stuff, it's very hard to get your, your head around exactly what's going on and when, and, and the central banks have a lot of um, leeway and, and things to do. But when you when you look at it, all it ever ends up being is shuffling a liability from one player to another player and somehow creating money to cover up that liability. And it sort of these liabilities sort of get shuffled up the chain. So if the Bank of Japan can't handle them, they will try and shuffle them off to the, the, the Fed. Uh, and if you're an ally of America, the Fed uh, does things like swap lines where they allow you to access US dollars in a, in a sort of way that it doesn't affect the exchange rate, I suppose. Um, if you're not an ally of the US, then you get the situation like we see in countries that have got hyperinflation like Turkey and things like that. But all, all the Fed actions seem to do when they try to stabilize market is create more money somehow in the system where it goes and it's complicated but it's somehow more money gets created somewhere in the system liabilities get shuffled from one party to another and that's been happening you know <laughs> for a long time uh, ever since the gfc is when i've been a professional it happened and that was my first eye-opening moment on that and it's been happening before that in other crises as well but what happens over time is the debt loads in japan are so high uh, and even in America, the debt loads in America are unsustainable. I, I read a, a report that said if you included like unfunded liabilities in the US, like things like Social Security and Medicare, 
the, the actual debt the US has got is it just ticked over 35 trillion US dollars. But when you well, include, actually, like, I've got one little factoid on that, Ryan. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. I think yeah. this this year is quite significant in that I think now to service the debt is greater than all the spending they've got on their military and or defense. Yeah, it is, exactly. And if you do the maths number. of it, exactly, that's exactly true. So if you do the maths of it, the 35 trillion plus the unfunded liabilities, which is money they've got to come up with to pay Social Security and Medicare in the future. The figures vary, but around about $150 trillion, which is immense. And and America, to pay that debt, just to service that debt, would need to be growing at roughly 12% per year, so 12% GDP growth per year, just to service that debt. And that's never happening. That's an immense figure. You know, usually it's typically, what, Greg, about 4% growth a year in an economy, 4 to 6 something like that, in a good yeah. year. So yep. if you think about the, uh, these long-term structural things, you've got unsustainable debt loads in America, which is the reserve currency. You've obviously got problems in other major countries, uh, economies like Japan, which are already we're seeing severe ramifications every time it looks like there's going to be consequences to it. So if that is the case with fiat money, this is the central argument of Bitcoin and gold, is you need to have another asset which is somehow growing at a faster pace than the debt or can somehow be revalued at a faster pace than the debt. And and you need an asset that doesn't necessarily exist in a big way in that, that fiat system. And so that's where the argument for Bitcoin and gold scarce hard monetary assets comes in. And you've got to remember that was how monetary systems worked in the past. They've now changed to more of a, a fiat-based system over the past 50 years. But the argument is that these things are hedges or, or, or even get out of jail free cards to a system which is structurally there's no point of return. There's just how long can you keep it going for, which as Greg said, could be decades. You, you never know with these things. But structurally, there's no way really of, of coming back from it. Uh, little things help. Inflation maybe helps more the debt in real terms. Um, uh, debt jubilees maybe on the cards. Um, maybe they'll try things with central bank digital currencies to control things. But again, that's not good things for, for ordinary people. Um, so I think that's mm. central to the argument of, of having some Bitcoin and gold exposure in, in, in a portfolio. Uh, and that's a big discussion and, and you know, it's, it's a lot to get your head around. But I think people can feel that today. Like, for example, inflation has run so high over the past few years. If you've not had a pay rise, you find that life is a lot more expensive. And that is just a function of fiat money crumbling in some way. Um, and I think ordinary people can see that with electricity bills and food uh, costs and, and petrol prices. That has been more noticeable in recent years because of certain actions during COVID, but that happens all the time. Um, and, and I think people are realizing, how can, I, how can I escape that? You know, how can I find a way where the purchasing power of my money um, maintains itself over time? You know, some people look at properties to do that and things like that. But that is a, a question that people need to start thinking about now, given the, the structural issues. Well, hopefully we can answer some of those questions next week. Uh, just to finish off, Greg, uh, uh, I'll, just to bring it back to Australia, because it touches on a lot of the things that Brian was just talking about. Uh, in your update, it was an intro, intro, I think it was your monthly edition this week, that you think it was, uh, you, you just mentioned that Australia per capita, in your view, is in depression. And that's quite a strong statement. I don't, can you explain what you mean by that? Because it seems like a quite a dire thing, but... I know our debt load isn't as big as the US, say. So what makes you just say that? And can you explain that? And then we can uh, wrap well, it up. Well, just, uh, just a factual information. The GDP per person has gone backwards for more than two quarters. Um, so the definition of a recession is when uh, the economy shrinks for, for two quarters or more. Uh, I think from memory, it's five quarters now that the uh, economy on a per person basis has contracted. So that's you know, the old school definition of a depression. Um, and that is that relates to the fact that the economy as a whole is, is barely growing. But then when you add the significant uh, increase in population growth that we've had, and then you divide the economic growth by the amount of people in the economy, mm. we're going backwards. So, for you know, that's the reason why a lot of people feel like um, we are in a recession. Um, you know, people don't really use the depression word anymore outside of, to ref references to the Great Depression, but you know, if when you when you look at the actual facts that we have had a contracting economy on a per person uh, basis for quite some time, then you know that's why some some 
parts of the economy and some sectors feel, you know, like they're really, really struggling. And, and of course, others are doing quite well. So you can't sort of, you know, pin it all on a, on a broader uh, topic. But that's where I got that comment from. There's just one other thing I want to say. I know we're going to wrap up, yep. but it was interesting. I saw a headline in the Financial Review yesterday and it said something like, you know, here, here are the top stocks or here are the top bargain stocks to buy after this week's sell-off. And I just thought, you know, what I do a lot of is I try to look at headlines and I try to look at um, what the market's thinking and what the what the sort of mood of the market is via headlines. Because when you get those sort of headlines, that means someone has to come up with the idea. That means they're taking broker's notes and, and regurgitating them. An editor might say, yeah, that's a good idea. We've had a sell-off. So to me, the market feels like it's still in this old paradigm of, of what happened before uh, Monday, and it's like, yeah, what, what, what? Where's the opportunities after a three percent sell-off from an all-time high? Where are the buying opportunities? And and these stocks that were listed, they're good quality stocks, but they're very expensive, good quality stocks that have corrected five percent, and now everyone's calling them a bargain. And you better get back in and buy them. To me, that's that's not the sort of behaviour that happens anywhere near a low. Um, and I'm not saying that that means that we are going into a a long bear market. I got no idea. All I do is try to find good stocks at a good value. But again, psychologically, when we're nowhere near bear market type of thinking or conditions or anything like that. So it was just an anecdotal bit of yeah. information that I thought was interesting. So I'm looking for really washed out bearish views that are pervasive in business media. Uh, and, I, and I'd say we're some time away from that. Cool. Well, hopefully we can give people a bit of a a different perspective than reading those kind of headlines. So that's, that's what it's funny you say that, Greg. Sorry, Willie, just shortly. Yeah, I saw yeah, from uh, some broker just uh, say that he was watching uh, inflows into this uh, triple leveraged NVIDIA ETF or something like that, or, or some sort of mag ETF. And he says the, the flows into that are still, are still coming. He says until they until they stop, then we're, we're not in a bear market. Like it, the sentiment hasn't shifted. So I saw exactly. support what you're saying as well. Yep. Good stuff. Well, look, I hope uh, that was a good, for those listening, I hope that, that was a good wrap up to the week. Uh, we'll have more of these conversations as we go. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, letters at fattel.com.au. Greg and I monitor that email inbox so it comes direct to us. Any questions, yep. let us know and we'll, and we'll take up the mantle next week. Thank you, guys. Have a great nice weekend. Thank you. We'll see you very soon. Cheers. Cheers, guys.